Jeremiah, the prophet, was uh, kind of had a very hard ministry. And what we're getting in, this, in that first reading is a section of his resentment, his frustration, his anger. He's angry at God. He's angry at people. And yet the powerful call he felt within him, in spite of all the setbacks, in spite of all the obstacles, it's, it really is a lesson in discipleship. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit in the homily today. But I think it's important maybe to set the stage a little bit story of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's ministry was one of God's earliest experiments in youth ministry. Jeremiah, the scholars tell us, was called to be a prophet at around the age of 15 or 16. He gave the typical prophet's response. If you read the Old Testament, you find that these prophets didn't always jump at the chance to be prophets. They knew it was a hard thing to be disciples, to be prophets. And Jeremiah's exact words, of course, I'm saying them in English, he probably said them in ancient Hebrew. He said, ah, uh, uh, Lord, not me. I don't know how to speak. And he wasn't talking about any impediment to his speech. He's talking about his lack of experience, his inability to take on what God had called him to take on which was the religious leaders and the political leaders, the economic environment, the social setting, people's lifestyles, ways of life. You see, his call was to announce to Jerusalem and all of Israel that because they had not followed the covenant and they had gone their own way and everybody was doing what they chose to do, it was right for them, that God had decided that the nation was going to be destroyed. The Babylonians were coming. It wasn't a thing they could do about it. It wasn't a call to repentance. It was a call to get ready for destruction. In fact, Jeremiah is called, I suppose again in a Hebrew idiom, his nickname, Old Doom and Gloom. Whenever he got up to speak, it was like, ugh, can't we get rid of him? And they did try to get rid of him. They put him in uh, what are called stocks, you know, where, where you have this wooden sort of wall and you, they stick your legs through it, your hands through it, your head through it. They lock it down so you can't get out of it. And humiliating, horrible things were done to him. He was the laughing stock day and night. He was in that thing for quite a period of time, trying to humiliate him and shut him up. He wouldn't shut up. They threw him down into a um, cistern, a sort of an underground storage place for water, probably uh, maybe in a room as big as this. Opening in the top, they lowered him down on a rope, hoping he would die. He didn't die. And in the midst of his being attacked by Sadducees and Pharisees and kings and nobles and even the general population, people just did not like the guy. In the midst of that, he calls out in that reading we heard today, you duped me, Lord, you fooled me, and I let myself be fooled. I will not speak his name anymore. I'm just going to hold it all in. I'm done with this. It's over. At the end of the reading, he says, but when I try to do that, it just builds up in me and I have to speak out. Jeremiah would have fit into our culture pretty well. People have kind of distanced themselves from God and religion, everybody having their own agenda, people not even be able to dialogue anymore without all kinds of anger and frustration and recriminations. Where if you were to be a person who spoke up for moral values and truth, if you were to speak up for Catholic faith teaching, you're going to find yourself attacked, canceled, marginalized, maybe hated, vilified, you name it. But throughout this summer, the readings from the Gospel of Matthew have called all of us to understand some things about discipleship and to be disciples. Let me just highlight a few things we heard this summer. A couple of weeks ago in the Gospel of Matthew, we heard this Gospel that says, Come to me, all you who are weary, who labor and have burden in your life, and I will refresh you. Think of it this way. Our anxieties and worries, the challenges we face, the things that we're angry about, Jesus knows them. And he wants us to come closer to him in the midst of those things. Come to me if you're weary and burdened, and I will refresh you. 
It's a call in the reality of our lives to come closer to Jesus in those realities and be refreshed so that we can continue discipleship. A little later in the summer, we heard the gospel of the sower who went out to sow seed. You remember the story. Some of the seed fell on rocky ground. Some of it fell on good soil. Some of it fell on the pathway. Some of it grew. Some of it didn't. One of the themes of that story is that the seed is given out freely wherever it can be received. And sometimes our hearts are like rocky soil or the footpath or or because of the scorching sun or the pressures of what it's like to try to live a Christian discipleship way of life, some of us give up. We at least get frustrated. We want to take a time out. But for some, we're ready for it to blossom 30 and 60 and 100 fold. But the point is that the word is given to everybody freely. The word comes to everybody who puts no obstacle in its path. And it can implant in our hearts. When it does, well, we heard another gospel about what happens when, when the kingdom of God, the seed of the kingdom of God is planted. In, in this other gospel, the, a little later on in the summer, it said that the wheat was planted by the farmer and all of his workers. But then they went out and they looked at the wheat and they said, in the middle of this wheat, there's a lot of weeds. How did the weeds get there? And they went back to the farmer and they said, should we pull the weeds out? Should we pull all those weeds out of the wheat? And some of you have spent a lot of your summer doing that, pulling weeds out of flower beds and maybe where you've planted vegetables and beautiful food. The farmer says, no, no, don't pull the weeds out because you might damage the wheat when you do that. Let them grow together. See, that parable is about what it's like to live the kingdom right now. Living the kingdom is going to be an experience of really good things like wheat and really tough situations like the weeds. It's not a sign that the kingdom of God is not here. It's the exact opposite. According to Jesus' definition of the kingdom, weeds and wheat together, growing. In fact, I would say if we find that the kingdom, the way we're experiencing it right now, is messy and hard and filled with all kinds of challenges, that's a sign that the kingdom is here. It's not a sign that the kingdom isn't here. It's weeds and wheat together. Sometimes we're that way in our own faithfulness, in our own way of following, we're mysteries to ourselves, aren't we? We do the very things we don't want to do. And the things we know we should do, we don't always do them. Our hearts are like weeds and wheat, a sign that the kingdom is here. There was a, also a gospel about our own patron, St. Peter. Remember, they're out in the boat and the storm is coming across the boat and they're scared. It's the middle of the night and they, and they see Jesus walking on the water and, and Peter says, if it's really you, tell me to come out to you. The church is in turmoil. Our country's in turmoil. Maybe some of your family lives for different reasons are facing turmoil. And Jesus calls you to come out of the boat into the midst of it to get closer to him. And as Peter is focused on Jesus, as Peter is, is able to say, I want to be closer to Jesus, he's fine. But when the very real turmoil of those waves and that storm sort of becomes obvious to him or begins to overwhelm him, then he sinks. He gets overwhelmed by it. You've done that. I've done that. You get overwhelmed by things. Because he got afraid. It says in that gospel, he was frightened. They were frightened in the boat. We're called to be closer to Jesus. Now, you hear a lot of that. I mean, I hear a lot of it on the blogs and in the suggestions that you get for spiritual growth. Maybe some of you have uh, podcasts that you go on. Recently, Father Mike Schmitz in his podcast on the Catechism in the Year talked about the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And among the things he said was, these are ways to develop a relationship with Jesus. Because so I think that's a hard concept. How do you develop a relationship with Jesus? You've got a lot of opinions on that. But I'm going to cite these three as he did. Faith, hope, and love. Here's the first one. Faith. Believing that God exists. And not only that, that God has created you and me out of love. He's created us out of love and he wants to accompany us. He, wants a relationship with us. God didn't 
need us to create us, but he chooses to be with us to redeem us. Curtis Martin, the founder of the program called Focus, that's where a lot of college kids go to college campuses. They try to form faith communities. Curtis Martin, he's, got, he's in hundreds of colleges across the country with his Focus teams. Here's what he tells them about faith. He says, ask yourself this question. Do you really believe that what you believe is really true? Do you really believe that what you believe is really true? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is present body, soul, mind, divinity under the form of bread and wine is the Eucharist? Do you believe that? Do you believe you were called by name, that God knows you and cherishes you and sees you in your dignity as you were created? Do you believe that you have that dignity? Do you really believe that what you believe is really true? Now, if you can get to that, if you can get to faith that says, I believe in God and I believe in a God who loves me and created me, then, he's, then Mike Schmidt suggests that the virtue of hope is the next step. That you make a decision, uh, you have a desire to be in that relationship with God. And that desire is empowered by the gifts and the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. That our hope is in not just optimism that things will get better, and not just in the possibility that we will be in ourselves good enough, but our desire is to be with God. Yes, in the ultimate sense of heaven, but also to be with God in the decisions that we make, in the way we speak and act. And that leads to the third theological virtue of love, faith, hope, and love. Jesus' command to us was love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Faith in God, desire to be in relationship with God, and then act like that. To love others, to look to the good of others, to will, to will and choose the good of others. To act always in a way that is good. Jesus doesn't say we have to like everybody. There's a lot of people that are hard to like. There's a lot of people that you have to work hard to love. But you can always will the good of others. That's what St. Thomas Aquinas taught. Love is the willing of the good of the other, as well as my own good. Love God and love your neighbor. You know, we do a lot of that very well here in this parish. Last week, the Honeybrook Food Drive Collection, 2,200 pounds of food that you gave. We've been consistent with that all summer long. A little above, a little below, 2,000 pounds of food every single month. We do a lot of feeding of the poor here through caring friends. We take care of the needy through the St. Vincent de Paul Society, the Good Works Program, where we help rebuild houses, where we reach out to those in need through the prayer shawl ministry. And I could go on with the many, many beautiful things that as parishioners, you do, as a parish, we're known for. And many other things you do that nobody else knows about. It has nothing to do with church, maybe. To love others and to will their good and to act that way. So back to ancient Jeremiah. He was mad at God. God had called him. He didn't think he was qualified, which <laughs> leads us all to be reminded that God does not choose those who are qualified. He qualifies those he chooses, and he's chosen you, he's chosen me to be disciples in this very complicated world with a lot of forces that are contrary to faith, contrary to Jesus Christ, contrary to teaching of the church, and it will always be a risk, brothers and sisters, to really live your discipleship. It will always be a risk, and there will be fallout and consequences. Do it anyway. Let's resolve to be great disciples.